Father, and the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For the observant Jew, kosher dietary laws have always been pretty important. Peter was no exception. And on top of all that, we know Peter was a pretty hard-headed, pretty thick-skulled individual. He was not exactly what one would label a progressive intellectual. Peter reminds me of Tevia in Fiddler on the Roof, whose famous line was, his famous word was, tradition. So Peter would not likely have ordered bacon and eggs for breakfast, had a hot dog for lunch, or shrimp cocktail and lobster thermidor for supper. In other words, Peter faithfully religiously kept kosher all the way. But he had a conversion experience. His menu was now about to get expanded. And I'm quoting here from Acts, the 11th chapter. But when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticized him. You entered the home of Gentiles and even ate with them, they said. Since his confreres were bombarding him with questions about why he dined with Gentiles, something expressly forbidden to Jews, well, he just had to tell them all about his conversion experience. He had to justify such a completely radical departure from tradition, from the law. Peter was at prayer, but he was also hungry. In mystical prayer, he fell into kind of a trance or just fell asleep as monks themselves have been known to do during a particularly repetitive boring monastic office. And in this trance slash dream, of course, going to sleep hungry, what did Peter dream of? He dreamt of food. We've all experienced that too, right? And what does he dream of? If If it were not a mixed metaphor, I would say he dreamed of forbidden fruit. That is, menu items strictly forbidden to observant Jews, like hot dogs, shrimp, pork roast, lobster, etc. And in that trance, a mysterious yet authoritative voice urges him, go ahead, Peter, eat and enjoy. It might as well have been that sneaky snake in the garden lobbying Adam and Eve. Peter essentially said in his own idiom, of course, no way, Jose. But after this tempting smorgasbord on a sheet had descended for the third time, the voice began to admonish him a bit more sternly. And so Peter reluctantly finally agreed. But the voice from heaven spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. This happened three times before the sheet and all it contained was pulled back up to heaven. What had previously been the only way no longer remained the only way. Other menu items had now been approved and added foods formerly forbidden. Coming to terms with the symbolism of this mystical daydream, Peter realized that God was saying something new, something entirely different. God was now saying that Jews, as well as Gentiles, would fall equally within the scope 
of God's love. It was no longer limited to Jews. And for Peter, this dream implied even more that this mission and ministry of broader inclusion was to be his. Peter learned a lesson that day which was destined to bear enormous fruit for his future ministry to Gentiles. It was to fulfill the promise we heard this morning from Revelation, our second reading. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. The phrase, a new heaven and a new earth, was code for doing away with monolithic, legalistic thinking. Yahweh was promising to, quotes, make all things new, to make more than one way acceptable, to include rather than to exclude. Someone once said that in spiritual life there are no coincidences, there are only God incidences. The next event made this extraordinary dream totally clear to Peter. The account from Acts continues, and I'm quoting here from Acts beginning at the 11th verse. Just then, three men who had been sent from Caesarea arrived at the house where they were staying. The Holy Spirit told me to go with them and not to worry that they were Gentiles. These six brothers here accompanied me, and we soon entered the home of the man who had sent for us. He told us how an angel had appeared to him in his home and told him, send messengers to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He will tell you how you and everyone in your household can be saved. As I began to speak, Peter continued, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as he fell on us at the beginning. Then I thought of the Lord's words when he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift He gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I to stand in God's way? When the others heard this, they stopped objecting and began praising God. They said, we can see that God has also given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. Well, sisters and brothers in Christ, this entire event from dream to fulfillment became a watershed in Peter's life. It expanded his horizon so drastically that even the hardest of heart could not go back, back to the narrow-minded, monolithic, exclusive, one-size-fits-all mentality. We might well ask ourselves this morning as we continue our post-resurrection tutorial pilgrimage. Where do we need to expand our horizons of what is or is not acceptable in God's sight? Many of us were raised in a religion which, in a word, kept kosher, adhered to an exclusive, well-defined, strict purity code How does the dream of Peter urge us to rethink our own rigid notions about what is holy or unholy, what is sacred or profane, what is clean or unclean? May God help us remember Peter's dream whenever we are tempted to ignore God's message for today. Amen, alleluia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.